Hello, podcast fans. This is Jason Burnett from the Archie Bray Foundation. Listen, we are celebrating the second birthday of our Brickyard Podcast Network with an online auction and fundraiser. 16 artists have donated work to help us raise money to support the network. If you are a fan of our podcasts, don't miss this chance to buy work from Sarah Pike, Roberta Lugo, Adrian Iliadis, Michael Klein, and many others. Every winning bid goes to support programming at the Bray. Bidding will start on the network's birthday, August 16th, and will run to August 19th. To find out more, visit us at givergy.us backslash the Bray Brick by Brick. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 475 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Annika Major. Her pottery features paintings of female figures created with subtle layers of watered-down underglaze. In the interview, we talk about the cow babe theme, which has been the focus of her recent exhibition, as well as making art that celebrates queer identity. We also talk about moving to the Pacific Northwest and building community at Seattle's Rain City Clay, where she is the studio manager. If you'd like to see her work, you can go to AnnikaMajor.com. Before we get to that episode, I wanted to thank the folks that have donated to our podcast. We are listener-supported, so I'd like to thank Laura Rasmussen and Anat Shifton for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do that at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about Texas, which is where you're from, right? Yeah. I grew up there. Um, I was born there. And I mean, I have this running history with it more as a theme and not necessarily like as a deep connection as somebody who's like Texas born and bred. Like both my parents are immigrants from Eastern Europe. So I really like I grew up there, but not with like your traditional American Texas kind of values being instilled or anything like that. I I spent a lot of time growing up just sort of watching that kind of concept or you know like watching the idea of like a Texan character or like the I think what really attracted me to it is just like the campiness of it and kind of viewing it as an outsider maybe um but then you know spending so much time there it really influenced a lot of the way that I dress a lot of the way that I make art and like a lot of the themes that I really I'm um, very connected to. And I could see behind you that you have some boots. <laughs> <laughs> I just got those. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and I got them here too, which was funny um, because I was like, oh, I'm going home soon. I should just like go get the boots locally. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so in Texas, there's a sense of pageantry that is just a part, you know, like there's the saying that everything's bigger in Texas. And one of the ways that that's true is hair, like women's hair. Or at least I, I, I'm a child of the 80s. So TV shows and actually my cousins did the same thing. They would like hairspray their hair like up onto the top of their head. And that was just a part of the Texas vibe. Yeah. I I think I still, I definitely adhere to that. I love when my hair is like a big poof. So (laughs) I, I don't know what it is, like where that came from. I think it's just like this really ridiculous sense of pride from being in a place that doesn't, doesn't take shit. But also gives shit. 
I feel like I've never found a place that makes its own, like another type of place that makes its own state shaped chips and candies. Like that is a staple there. It's just very (laughs) strange, but I, I kind of love it. It's very campy, very like it's, it's its own fun concept. At what point did you start seeing cowgirl imagery? Because that's something that comes into your work. I I mean, I grew up going to the rodeo and really loved watching um, just like all the like pageantry. Um, they have a bunch of different um, shows that happen, um, which one of my favorites was barrel racing, where these gorgeous women come out on horses and they're just <laughs> like at the peak of their sport, like doing really, I mean, it's really cool. Um, and I think part of it is that is that it's always a little bit of like, it's a show. It's, you know, meant to be entertaining. It's meant to be exciting and a little bit thrilling. And then as I got older and I, you know, started getting more self-exploratory um, and I think in college too, I mean, I started, I went to my first like um, queer burlesque show in the college town that I um, went to. and. Um, there were lots of different shows that had like cowgirls as characters. And I think part of it developed through that. We're going to talk more about queer identity, but I want to go back to barrel racing and how badass that is. (laughs) It's so freaking cool. Like, I'm sorry, a horse is like a giant vehicle and absolutely terrifying. And you can get it to run around, around a tight corner of a barrel. (laughs) That's cool. I grew up around horses a lot and barrel racing was often a, like one section of the show. And at different times I worked for the horse show. So when you're down on the ring and those horses, it's a time for people that haven't seen, it's a timed event. So they come in the front gate and oftentimes they're already running full speed as fast as a horse can go into an enclosed space towards a barrel and the woman on top, you're right. There's like a certain type of beauty because They're hanging on, but they're also sort of harnessing the power of the horse. So they're going full speed. And then, as you mentioned, they go right into the, uh, like, to turn around a barrel. And then they go to the second barrel and the third barrel. But the point is, is, like, it's chaos, but it's also very organized. And I think that that is great for art. Like, that concept of, like, we're going to do something outrageous, but then we're going to give it some parameters. Yes. Uh, I think, like, that specific facet really draws me in um and you know then I've gotten just more into the general style of cowboys cowgirls cow babes whatever you want to call them um but it's all I feel like it's all super informed by that like the that's always in the background I think can you talk about art making as an expression of queer identity uh, of your queer identity I went to school um to be a painter at first And I've always been a figure painter or figure drawer. I feel like it's the best self-expression for me. And just the body is the best mode of expression. And at first it was just strictly anatomical. Like I was just trying to present the form. Um, And then I started, when I went to school, I just started getting into more conceptual theories and um, a little bit more like inward self-expression. Um, And I think I was also going through just like a period of growth too, but I spent several years just doing self portraits and a lot of nude art of myself and other people, because I felt like it was just the bare bones, like, you know, here's me as a person. And I think I also, you know, was going through like, you know, coming to terms with the fact that I was queer um, and I had started out dating men and was like, it's this like pipeline of oh, I'm bi, oh, I'm pan, oh, I'm that, like, you know, kind of like tightening the the lens a little bit every time, like you change your mind of like, oh, I might be something a little different and, you know, not having to put a name to it. But I think some of it was the coming to terms with my queerness and like being a lesbian was always such a taboo in my mind. I think just because of the way that I grew up with my, with my folks and the area that I grew up in. And um, so I think making art was definitely a really wonderful way to explore that and also just figure out what facet I fit into. All the um, self-portraiture was definitely like it was all nude but it was non-sexual and it was really just like trying to get a look at my inner self. 
Yeah, and the, and the concept that the body is the stand-in for the soul is like that's that goes back in art history like forever. It's- but I I like the way that once you, and we're, we'll talk about this, but once you went into pots, the bodies then wrap around the forms in a really interesting way. You're very rarely seeing like a, let's say if you're doing a nude, you're not seeing like a head to toe a depiction in the body. It's more like um, the chest will be on one side, then the legs are kind of wrapping around the bottom. So how did you figure out one how to have a perspective on the nude form, but then two like how to make that work on a pot? Yeah. So, I mean, I took all the classes at the beginning of like how to, you know, do anatomy and how to get the shading right and all of that. And then when it came to pottery, I feel like all of the rules just went out the window because, you know, I started, I started off with, I mean, I had really great teachers, but they didn't know anything about working with underglaze. Um, neither did I. So I started off working with mason stains and painting with those. And that was a bust. And then I started getting a little bit more into underglaze and it was just totally different rules than working with paint. So, you know, I think I spent a lot of time at the beginning, just figuring out the material. And of course, the best way that it worked for me was just treating it like I wanted to. Um, and the same thing with painting, I, started off, you know, working in acrylics and moved into oil paint. And then I feel like I had my best breakthrough when I combined oil painting and working with pastels and charcoal and lots of multimedia and just treating the materials how I wanted them to function. And so the style that I have currently is a little bit of a um, departure from my painting style uh, with oil paints, which is a little bit watercolory. Um, but I'm still using oil paints. So I think I was attempting to channel that initially, but, you know, with the limitation of not knowing how to use underglaze. So I spent a lot of time learning the underglaze, treating it like I wanted to, having a ton of failure. Um, And Skin tones are tough with underglaze and, you know, getting it right can be really hard at the beginning too. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out like getting proper skin tones and just trying to make it look like this person's even relatively alive. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, once I figured that out, I think wrapping them around the pots took some time. I think I was definitely treating the forms like a canvas where you have just a main central figure. Um, and then I think one Ensika I went, it was, a, it was like the last Ensika I went to, I think. Naomi Clement was one of the... Um, exhibiting artists and she was doing um a demo um of her beautiful surface work and it just sort of clicked into my mind when she's I always give this to my students but um she said that the bottom of the pot is a gift for the person doing the dishes or like a surprise for the person doing the dishes and I loved that and I think that sort of broke me out of that mentality that I really had to just stick to the front of it um And so then I just started experimenting more with extending imagery and thinking of it more as, you know, blocking out sections like the walls, the bottom, the sides, Um, and, you know, not feeling too frustrated by them being anatomically correct, because I think they could really be correct from whatever angle you're looking at it from. You know, they're stretching, they're bending um, and curving, and um, I think it makes it easier when you're not viewing like a something like a cup um from all sides at all like all the time so you're only seeing it from like little specific perspectives that make sense and one of the things you mentioned about skin tone is is that if you get it wrong it can be dead like the person looks like they're dead yes and it's also the same with proportion you know like if you if you have too much bone and not enough um skin or fat or you know like like substance on the body, you actually, it's like the opposite of what happens when you get on a camera and it adds 10 pounds. I feel like in art, it's like if, if it's depicted wrong, it you subtract 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it definitely ends up looking very like skeletal or a little bit like, like, I don't know that, I don't think that my work is considered like extremely anatomically correct in any fashion. Like, I definitely think I have a case of like same face syndrome a little bit where each character (laughs) a little bit like me but not quite um which I don't mind that I actually think it's quite fun um you know like if they look weird I definitely wipe them off and I start over because 
like, I feel like I've gotten to that point where editing has been really helpful. Like if it looks bad, we're not going to keep going. We're going to start over. Is same face syndrome, is that a thing? Like that painters paint themselves? I don't know about painters specifically, but I've seen this a lot with just like artists online in general, where some people I think are creating the same style of face for each person or character that they're drawing. But I know for me, I've had this chronically for my entire life. Even when I was in like my life drawing classes, my professor was like, oh, you know, they all kind of have like Annika vision. But that's okay. <laughs> like, so I mean, they've all, they've all kind of been like that. Even when I was drawing a model from life, they would have a little bit of my features, which is, you know, something to work on, but I don't mind it as much. Yeah. And I feel like being aware of it, it almost becomes funny as opposed to, I think the problem is if you put up like a whole solo show of paintings and then all of a sudden people are like, this is just you doing this action and that and you doing that action. <laughs> and I don't get that feeling from your pots. <laughs> Thanks. I, I do try. I try not to make this my face. <laughs> but yeah, I think it always ends up being like, I'll finish a round of work and have some pots on the table or whatever. And my studio mates will come over and be like, oh, this kind of looks like you. Like, oh, this like little thing. I'm like, yeah, it could be, could be, you know. Do you get your studio mates to pose in terms of like leg? Like, can you go sit in that chair and move your leg this way? The bodies do often wrap around the form in very specific ways. I used to do that. I think I had, um, I used to take photos that I would work from because I was very strict about using taken image like my own imagery um and then I sort of relaxed on that a little bit and I actually have like a Pinterest board like 500 images deep of just you know nice photography or um you know different fashion and like magazine images um that I will if I need some inspiration I pull from that but I'm really just kind of looking at different faces and poses and then I sort of will you know combine those whatever I'm working on so I usually just kind of go looking for images based on each pot that I sit down to decorate because it's all, I don't really go in with a, or I don't make them with a plan. Can you talk about adding makeup or blush to, I think it's blush, right? That's what goes on cheeks? Yes. Okay. Because a lot of the figures have that and it does, it adds to the campiness, but it also makes them seem happy. Like it's, they seem excited. Can you talk about figuring that out? Yeah. It's, it's very much after my own makeup. I really like a good, you know, smattering of whatever color on my face. I feel like it just adds a little fun and flair. Um, so I think that definitely informs how I paint my figures. But I think um, the makeup aspect of it is just a little bit ingrained in me. Um, I've done it. I do it all the time of putting my own makeup on and just for like a fun preparation of my day. So when I'm making characters, they feel a little bit close to my heart. So I'm definitely decorate them or paint them with that aspect. But um, the layering of color, I think, really adds a little bit more life than I think if I just left it like flesh tone or if I just added shadows, which when you look at skin, you have so many different colors happening in there, like, you know, yellows and reds and purples and blues. And um, they're really subtle unless you're sitting down and actually looking at your skin. So I think inherently I want to add those in even if it's, you know, kind of minor or not noticeable in some, some areas. And is it underpainting that allows you to do that? Cause you, you, you get some really nice subtlety to the curves of the face. It's actually overpainting. Um, so I lay down a skin tone first, just, I basically just block out from background to foreground. Um, so I lay down the two layers of underglaze um, skin tone, and then I layer a bunch of thin watery layers of underglaze on top of that. So I'll usually do like reds or oranges um, or browns for the face. And then when I'm adding shadows, it's like watered down black or blue um, or other colors sometimes too. But um, that's normally like it's all layering on top and then I'll add like an outline um, with just one color. And how long are, are some of these pieces? Like, let's say your platters that are in that show um, at Good Earth, like how long would that take? Strictly just the decoration, I would say at least an hour or two, um, sometimes more if I take breaks in between them. Um, I've got a basket in that show that I think took me weeks because I just kept, I, like I worked on it and then I like sat down and stopped and was like, oh, I got to go work on some other things. So I try not to like 
let them sit for too long because then I'm prone to breaking them. Everything <laughs> in my studio as greenware and gets decorated at green, like bone dry greenware. And then they all get bisked. So once they're bisked, they're pretty immediate glazing and then they're finished. But I have a lot of work just sitting around my studio, just bone dry pots waiting to be decorated. So can you talk about how characters re well, this is, I guess the first question is, are these characters repeating? Cause I was looking at that show and I couldn't tell if it's exactly the same people repeating or if this is a whole cast of characters. I am sometimes repeating, but not intentionally. Um, I think I've got like a little method of, you know, selecting skin, hair, highlights, et cetera, and like different um, accessories for them. Um, and sometimes I'm drawn to the same colorways for specific characters. Um, so if I'm making a set, I definitely will repeat the same characters. So it feels a little bit more fluid. That's definitely something I've been working towards more, um, because I'm so prone to just treating each object like its own story way and narrative. Um, so tying work together through similar imagery has been kind of my next or most recent activity is just like trying to create a little bit more fluidness between different objects and bringing them together. In that show, the the cowgirl theme is something that kind of runs throughout that whole body of work. How did that show come about? Like, did you have this concept? I'm going to have a completely a cow babe, I think is how you call them. <laughs> Were you thinking I'm going to have a cow babe show or is this, how, how does that work when you're trying to send work out to a gallery? I definitely wanted to have a cow babe specific show for, for Good Earth. Um, Anne-Marie, um, the owner of the gallery, and I had talked about, about it. Um, and like that is a, it's a theme or narrative that I've really been delving into recently. I think I felt really embarrassed by it at first. Like, oh, people are going to think she's weird for wanting to only do cowgirls or I don't know, you know, you make up things in your head and then nobody actually cares about like. <laughs> you know, like you're the only one stressing yourself out. Um, but I had been, I've just been really enjoying it as a theme. Um, and it's kind of all I've wanted to paint lately, um, lately being like the last year or two. <laughs> um, so having a like specific themed show for it just felt normal for me, but I definitely have other pots that I omitted, um, that I made around the same time frame that were not cow babe themed. Because I always wonder as a painter, because I, I, I paint motifs, but mine are more flo floral. When I'm sending a show out to a gallery, I don't want to have too many of the same because it just seems repetitive. But when there's a figure, you instantly think of that as like, oh, that's a person, that's a person. It doesn't feel repetitive. It just feels like you're making a whole cast of characters. Yeah. I think part of it is that it's helpful I don't repeat too much. Um I don't like making the same thing over and over. I find it frustrating and a little bit monotonous, which is what painting started to feel like at the very beginning. Um, I, when I was strictly working with oil paints, um, it just felt like the same process over and over and over again of like stretching a canvas, sitting down to work at that canvas and like prepping my paints and blah, blah, blah. And when I sit down to decorate a pot, it doesn't have that feeling. Um, it just has a total fluidness to it and I can sit down and create something fresh and, you know, with a different emotive thought or narrative behind it every time, even if it's similar imagery, um, which I think feels pretty special. It's, I think, a bigger part of why I don't paint with oil paints very much anymore. Um, but yeah, like making work that is the same over and over and over again does not scratch my clay itch. How is that work received in different areas of the country? So for instance, that shows in Colorado, you're in Seattle, and you could, you know, show that work in Texas, for instance, where people might relate to the iconography. How, how does that go depending on where you are? Well, the Good Earth Show is in northern Washington. It's in um, Bellingham. Oh, I thought they were in Boulder for some reason. I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> That's Okay. <laughs> I have work there and then I have work at Companion Gallery, which is in Tennessee. Um, and then I also have work in um, at Charlie Cummings Gallery, which is in Florida. Um, so it's been interesting to see how it's received in different areas. I would say, I guess if I'm strictly looking at sales, Tennessee has been a little bit 
better just because I think that my theming might fit a bit more with that kind of rural, like, you know, I don't know. I've never been to Tennessee, so I'm not going to even try to imagine. Um, but I mean, I think compared to like Washington and Florida, there's not as much of a demand for cowgirl themed imagery um, just because it's not, I don't know, people might not have as personal of a connection to it, but online sales definitely make that easier. Yeah, I actually haven't shown work in Texas before. I mean, I showed paintings when I was a student there, but um, since I left Texas, I haven't had a show back there. And that's something I would like to do maybe for the future. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Greg, supervisor of Krug Clay Production at Amico. We are proud to supply clay for your studio or classroom. This episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find Amico clay glazes and equipment at your local Amico distributor. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Well, as I'm interviewing you, I'm looking in the background there and I see like stickers, <laughs> all this sort of imagery that does seem like it relates to your work in some ways. So can you talk about what your pop culture influences are that then inform the work or just your interest in general? I am a more is more type of person. Um, I'm a big fan of just collecting knickknacks and um, I love when my space feels cluttered but organized <laughs> um but I mean off to the side here I've gotten you know tables full of plants and um lots of little critters and weird characters floating around my room so I think I definitely have a lot more um childish interests that are still sticking with me into adulthood which I don't mind um adulthood I'm nearly 29 here but <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think I still just have an interest and love of like collecting little things and, um, you know, filling my space with as much um, colorful and um, just fun, soft little things that, you know, just like bring little joys to my life. And I think a lot of my um, influences and interests are still just um, like the collecting type of aspect of like. I mean, I think plants and gardening is definitely part of that. Like just watching something grow from your own hands. Yeah. Things like that. So are you into comics or um, graphic novels in any way? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think I just like, I love keeping my eyes and my hands and my brain busy. So lots of reading of comics and um, like watching lots of random shows and things like that. Um, I always have something running in the background in my studio, just like some noise to fill my brain. So I, I was showing my wife your work and we were talking about the similarities of some of the compositions in old pulp fiction novels from the 50s. And it's, especially there's this whole genre of lesbian pulp fiction. Mm -hmm. And is there a crossover there? Like, have you, do you, are you familiar with that genre? I'm not too much. Um, I know of it a little bit. And I, I mean, I grew up like drawing constantly and really wanted to, I mean, I mean, I started off wanting to make comics and and but could not form a coherent storyline to save my life so I just <laughs> was drawing the characters um and I think the storytelling thing came later for sure but was really interested in it for sure and then kind of took a departure when I got more interested in fine art and was like I'm gonna leave this stuff behind doesn't feel like I can work with that where I'm at right now um but definitely definitely really like interested in like that kind of imagery and narrative yeah, and I'll, I'll when we get off here, I'll look it up because there's a great Fresh Air interview where Terry Gross is talking to one of the really pro prolific authors of that time, and I, I tried to find it, but I could not. I can't remember the woman's name, but she had she had written um, with a pseudonym, and they they were just talking about the dynamics of like lesbian literature in the '50s and what that meant. You know, like what level of danger you were willing to maybe accept putting everything out there in a story. So oftentimes they were love stories, but they never ended well. Like they always kind of had this doom and gloom aspect of it. 
And I feel like that's the opposite of your work, which always has this kind of like sunny disposition (laughs) about it. So could you talk a little bit about like, how do you gear the, how do you make emotional impact with your artistic decisions? I definitely see that in queer media and specifically lesbian media. There's not very many, you know, TV shows, books, comics um, that are about lesbian characters that are ending happy or that are um, just like, you know, a normal, like it's just a normal facet about the show or whatever that, you know, doesn't end in doom. And I think I'm basically making the work that I wanted to see when I was coming to an understanding about myself. Um, And I feel like I definitely am making more happy-go-lucky, positive, sunny work because I wanted to see that when I was younger. And I feel like it wouldn't have made such a strange, like, you know, impact in my brain about being a lesbian. I think I definitely worked through some of that internalized shame of being a lesbian because of the media depicting like, you're only going to have tragedy. Your relationships will all end poorly. Like you cannot have happiness in that type of relationship. And, you know, I wanted to make work and I still want to make work that the young me wanted to see. So I feel like I still carry a little bit of her as I'm making work into my adult years because it's just like, even now when I, you know, see adult, um, you know, or when I see TV shows that are about lesbians, like one of my more favorite ones recently is First Kill, which is like a Romeo Juliet, like vampire story. Very good. Would recommend. Um, But it's canceled. You know, it got canceled. They're not renewed for another season. And it just feels like everything is about that. And it's like super doomed from the start. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting how in the fantasy realm, it seems like that that straight people can watch gay relationships easier maybe because, because it is fantasy. At least I'm, I'm literally thinking of Netflix. Like when you scroll through Netflix's um, algorithm, like the shows that make it, I feel like I have a specific example in my head of another vampire show and I cannot recall what it is, but where there's gay relationships in the vampire context, but the show is popular, but it's the exact same show there's no vampires. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and exactly. Then all of a sudden, like the criticism is different. Yes. I mean, and I don't know how much I can speak to this, but there's a lot of difference between gay relationships of men specifically too. like there have been a lot of really sweet and positive TV shows that have made it recently um, that do like that are more centric on men, which I think has been a little bit easier to swallow maybe. And I don't know why that is. And I am curious about it too. I mean, I watch them and I enjoy them. And I think I just, I love to see queer media about happy, thriving relationships because it's also kind of an honoring of people just having happy relationships. And there has been so much pain in queer history that it feels like it's just nice to have a positive, a positive show, positive depiction and relationship for once that doesn't you know, make me like need to cry after I watch it. (laughs) Or if I do cry, it's in a positive way. So, um, but for some reason, you know, lesbian media is still kind of catching up. It's both in like a, there's two sides of it of like, it's got this weird fetish, fetish, fetishization. And so like, it's just, you know, it's kind of just a concept, you know, as I'm, you know, getting older and kind of reading more um back into lesbian media it's like still so much to learn there's a lot of history that i don't know about yet that is informing a lot of the way that work is made now well i think some of this too is that when you insert the male gaze into sort of a lesbian storyline it's not very realistic yeah. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> leans on the fetish not on like no this is you're not depicting actual real life, but I like that a lot of your work, especially the nudes, the older nudes, like that felt like everyday life pots. Yeah. I think that was definitely a, something I was really strong, feeling strongly about when I was making nude work, um, uh, on my pots. And then as a painter too, I spent a lot of time doing, you know, defending my work and, and critique about like, well, they're nude, that's sexual. And it, it wasn't, um, I think one of the bigger, breakthrough moments for myself and just for my work was I the very last piece that I finished in school was a just full frontal nude of myself trimming my pubic hair I don't know if that's something I can say sure yeah but I 
felt really proud of that. And I, it was just totally for me. It was, I was putting all of myself on display, but it was completely for me. And it made a lot of the people in my class uncomfortable, specifically the men or the, you know, the cis men in my class. But I think I connected with more of my classmates because of that in a way that felt like, here's me, here's the parts about me that I felt shame for, that I'm sharing and wanting to initiate a conversation. And it was real and it, you know, had every fold and hair and whatever. Um, And I think that's when it really started clicking, clicking a bit more for me that I could just be making work about my body and how I felt and it didn't have to be weird. And if someone was going to be taking it in a sexual way that that's their business, but putting that imagery to pots, then um, like, there's definitely a little bit more of a sexual aspect to it, I think, because it's an object that you're taking with you. You know, it's something that you have a relationship with and, you know, you're drinking your water out of this cup, but there's a nude body on it. And, you know, the reasons that you maybe picked that cup up or whatever, like I can't control those, but I can definitely control, you know, the, the narrative and intimacy that I put to it. Well, you, you hit it right there is intimacy. A lot of the depictions you have, the intimacy is that they seem like just completely everyday moments. Like you get up, roll out of bed, take a shower. And then that is the moment versus sort of a patriarchal look at, at lesbian fiction or, or, or the way that lesbians have been portrayed. It's, it, it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> like it just doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't feel real. Yeah. But I, I did want to actually take a sidetrack and talk about Instagram and social media, because yeah. I know sometimes when you're depicting nudes, like the algorithm that picks out nudity assumes all nudity is sexual. And that's just Instagram's baseline. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's just no nipple of any sort, right? So how do you make a living as an artist selling work online and not kind of hit that algorithmic block or censorship? Well, I constantly live in fear. Um, (laughs) I mean, I I don't make as much nude work now, um, partly because of how it's kind of received by galleries, which is I've been in the gallery world a little bit more for the last year or so. so. having to have that conversation with myself that that is maybe not the audience for that work. Uh, But when I sell work on my website or on my own, I'm not worried about things like that. But I definitely have to be creative about what pots I'm sharing on to Instagram at this point. Um, I used to just very freely share the drawings or the paintings that I was working on and the pots I was working on that might have been nude or even potentially sexual, Um, always with taste in class or whatever. Um, But I think I just, you know, I have a website, I can throw that stuff on there and, you know, I can share the little tidbits that are, um, you know, enough to get someone from there to my website. Yeah. I like that idea that Instagram is just pointing them in the direction. You're just enticing them to get to the shop, which is ultimately on your, your site. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how, what the forms you make are and how you make those that are then the paint that you paint on top of them? So I'm throwing and hand building and doing a combination of both for a lot of the forms that I have. Um, And I'm pretty dedicated to making more or less strictly functional work, um, which I think coming from a background as a painter has been an interesting adjustment because I'm not trying to think of everything as a canvas and sometimes it does end up that way. So um, I've kind of gone back and forth between surface and form production in my mind. Um, so spending a lot of time actually making this lumpy, bumpy object functional, um, and making sure not only is it comfortable, but you know, that the liquid flows right, or that it, you know, isn't going to fall over, um, if I knock into it. Um, and I think a lot of that has been a fun challenge as well, because I mean, I'm still working with, you know, the basic forms of throwing hand building and all that, and then combining them really like opened up a door, I think, um, of not just everything had to be round and circular on the wheel. And then everything hand built didn't have to be so like crisp and geometric, but I could make these like soft and flowing forms that felt a lot like bodies, um, which then become really enjoyable surfaces to put figures on. Are you familiar with Jason Briggs's work? Yes, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, the way he makes curves and crevices, like I saw the slide talk he did one time and he said he loved 
that when you look at the curve of, I'm, I'm, for the listener, I'm bunching up my arm here. When you look at the curve that's in your elbow, you can't tell, is that a butt crack or is that an elbow curve? Yeah. And his work <laughs> is all about that, like like riding that fine line between like, what am I looking at? But I, I actually, when I was looking at some of your Instagram posts of your undecorated work before you paint on it, I also had that feeling like you explaining this to me, I still can't figure out how you get the form and then decorate it. Like there's some magic <laughs> that's happening with your because of your practice and, and that this is something you're dedicated to. But can you talk about that, like figuring out how tight a form needs to be and how loose it might need to be so that it does match your drawing style? I think this has still been like a, not struggle, but I think definitely um, finding where that right line is for something to be too representational of the body and still, but also still being like soft and flowy that does remind you of a little bit like a, you know, very plush stomach or some folds and rolls. Um, and I think I'm still at a little bit of my own limitation of skill or not limitation, but I'm still, I think I'm still learning um, and looking for the right um, making tools to, to make that work that I'm really interested in. Um, so finding like finding a way to make work that is both soft, but tight at the same time um, is a lot of um, just going back and forth. And I smash so many pots, like just trying to find the right shapes that I'm looking for. Um, and then, you know, when I sit down to decorate something, I, you know, I said I was a more as more person. And I think that definitely applies to my work. And I've had to dial that back as well, because it's super chaotic um, to have an object that is just constantly buzzing with, you know, figures and patterns and colors and everything happening all at once. And so I think that was a little bit of a practice for me to scale back. Um, and to make something a little bit more harmonious that not only, you know, was visually appealing, but matched the form that I was making and wasn't just making something as a vehicle for, um, for decorating. Yeah. And I think about like a form, like your cups, they're moving in lots of different directions in terms of the axis, you know, like they poke out on one side and then there'll be a smooth side and then they'll poke out on the opposite side. But then let's go back to the basket form that was in that show at Good Earth. That was an amazing piece. Totally different. Like it's not, the, the sense of touch is not there. It is more about the visual because the object's larger. But then what are the other considerations that you think about when you're making s sort of a special service piece like that? I think that's definitely a form I'm still exploring um, and still getting a little bit more acquainted with. And that particular form is so much more surface heavy because I'm, you know, giving myself these areas to play. And so I was wanting to create an object where I could have the negative space of holes to create specific imagery um, of, um, you know, fences or barns or anything. And um, I think that one is forcing me a little bit, like those specific forms are forcing me to think a little bit more about the image before I actually start making um, which has been really good for me, actually. <laughs> um, I actually have one in my window right now that has plants in it because it has a small crack. Um, so I've definitely, I'm definitely keeping more of them than I'm putting out in the world at this point since they're so new. But, um, you know, they definitely don't have that same tactile aspect with the bumps. So I think of them a little bit more as a like scenery object. Um, maybe having a little bit more background noise and information um, like, you know, the images that you might see behind the cowgirl, um, like the fences and the barns and the the plants and the flora um, of wherever that cow, cowgirl is coming from. In the table as landscape concept is something that I've worked a lot with in my own work. So I like this idea that this potential that that would be a centerpiece within the table and then the plates, the cups, everything else is telling a narrative. And that's kind of the background, so to speak, but it does provide sort of a larger context for the work. That seems really um, interesting to me. Do you ever make like big tableware sets? I have tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I recently just had like an issue with my clay where everything was cracking. So I had a lot of plates, which is, you know, one of your big tableware items. Uh, when I was making them, um, you know, 
and started working on sets like that, it was really fun to be able to think of each place setting as a different character, all coming to the same place. Um, and all of them, you know, converging at this same, you know, barn or bar or whatever to swap stories and have conversations and share, you know, their life story. Um, and I really want to make more work now that my clay issue is hopefully fixed, knock on wood. Um, you know, but now that I can actually go back to making sets um, a little bit in that fashion, I'd really like to explore that concept more. There was this piece that Patty Warashina made in the 80s where she documented all of her friends, made sculptures of them, and it was these big figure, or they're actually not that big, but figures walking over this bridge. Phenomenal piece. If I can find a picture, I'll send it to you because it. I love Patty Warashina's work so much. <laughs> I don't think she's celebrated enough. Like, I really feel like what she did when she did it was way before so many people. Yeah, she's. Phenomenal in her work is absolutely incredible. But it made me think about community, like she was depicting her community. How have you been able to find community in Seattle outside of the studio? And do you ever feel like your friend does something or someone does something and you're like, oh, I'm definitely putting that in work? <laughs> <laughs> I um, I try not to paint too much of my friends so that it's not one of those like please don't put this on a pot moment type of situation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I, I mean, my emotions definitely influence the way that my work is decorated. Like I think if I'm having a depressive period, most of my characters are crying. It's okay. That's fine for me. I, um, you know, have sometimes moments where my, my work will come out and then my studio mates or my friends um, will come down and look at something and be like, is this, is this me? Did you get inspired by me? It looks a little bit like me. And <laughs> I mean, I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, not directly, you know, but I mean, I think I, you know, I've had a few bad breakups or whatever that I've definitely put onto work and I've kept some of those for myself because they feel like, you know, they feel too intimate to share just yet, I guess. Um, so, you know, they're a little bit for me and I think they're definitely part of like a healing process or going through like rough family situations or, you know, traumatic life events, whatever. Um, and, you know, when those get put onto pots, they feel still personal, but they definitely feel like they, I'm transferring some of that energy away from me in a way that feels healing. Well, that, that whole, the old concept pain shared is pain lessened. I love the idea that you're kind of sharing the emotion, even if the person doesn't look like it didn't have to be representational, you know, like it's more that you're just letting that out as the process of making. And I, I think that's one of the beauties of clay itself is it's so responsive and fulfilling to touch that it's soothing, I think, in that way. Yes. And I mean, going back to community, like clay is so deeply community based. Like, you know, you can have your own studio and you can have your own, you know, kiln and equipment and everything. But so much of our experiences come from community spaces. And I think, you know, coming to Washington and starting off in a community space has really been so valuable for me because it definitely reminds me, um, you know, that how much people are a big part of my practice um, and daily interactions influence that. And just also being able to bounce ideas from other people and just have these like little daily things that kind of keep me going um, that, you know, make me want to keep putting things on pots and make me want to keep making work for sure. Can you talk about coming to the West Coast and specifically to the Pacific Northwest? So I graduated in 2018 uh, from, from the University of North Texas and the um, department head there, uh, Brooks Oliver, really, really wonderful guy. He went to school with Deb and she had an open call for an assistant at the time at her studio, Rat City Studios. So I just was like, oh, I could, you know, after I graduate, I could decide to stay here um, or I could do something totally crazy and apply for an assistantship. I applied on a whim a little bit, just like, oh, let's see what happens, you know. I, you know, had done a little bit of um, assistant, assisting work at that point. I was the um, studio tech assistant at my college for about a year, but kind of like, oh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But there weren't very many community studios in um, the area that I was in, in Dallas, like Denton area. And so it was sort of a question of, do I start my own space or do I get some friends together to create a collaborative space? 
or do I go look for something that's already established? Um, and, you know, I got gifted a kiln that was a project kiln and I had never done any, you know, repair work at that point. So it felt a little bit daunting, um, but interviewed with Deb, got the position. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I actually have to move to Washington <laughs> now. So let's, let's start backing up. How was the adjustment to the weather? Like the Pacific Northwest is no joke. Like it is dark a lot there, but that seems to, that's okay with you. It, it has become okay with me. I definitely had an adjustment the first couple of years that I lived here. Seasonal depression is for real. Um, you know, I do miss the Texas sun every now and again. Um, but I have to say, uh, looking back at the weather in Texas, um, I will take 80 degrees over a hundred and whatever any day. <laughs> yeah. The winters, the winters were rough. There's, it's a lot grayer. Um, it doesn't really rain that much, but I think it's just like the long stretches of time without the sun definitely get to you. But I've found the magic of the Pacific Northwest, which is going out and hiking, enjoying the outdoor activities and not sweating like crazy <laughs> um, camping. I'd never camped before I moved here. I was like, "Ew, why do people do this? <laughs> there are so many mosquitoes and deadly snakes and gross bacteria in the water that could hurt me. And <laughs> Here at there, I mean, you still have snakes and bugs, but you know, it's not even the same experience outside um, here versus back in Texas. Can you talk about making it work as a young potter in Seattle in terms of like finding housing, finding, you know, ways to make money and all of that? So when I moved here um, to work as an assistant, it was a work trade experience. So I wasn't being paid. Um, if I, when I started teaching, that was paid. Um, was very reluctant to begin teaching because I never thought of myself as a teacher. Um, I love it now. Um, and, you know, we'll talk on that later. But it's, you know, it was hard um, at first because the cost of living here is so much higher than in Texas. Um, the rent that I was paying um, in the last house I'd lived in was like, you know, the my rent in Seattle was like triple. Um, which was stressful. So I had a part-time job at the same time working for Deb at the very beginning. And I was I was pouring candles, actually. So it was kind of fun, still a creative job, um, but that was also hard work. So I was um, doing assisting work for about 20 hours a week. I was working part-time 20 hours a week and um, trying to fit my own practice in between all of that. And it was a lot and it was really good. Um, I don't have that same kind of energy <laughs> <laughs> um, anymore, but I, you know, as I've continued working for her, I have started teaching more. I teach at a couple of different studios um, in Seattle now and um, became the manager of her studio. Um, and then about a year ago, she, well, a little more than a year ago, but she wanted to open up this new space, Rain City Clay. And I am the manager of that space now. So I do tech work. Um, I just you know, keep things flowing and moving there and um, loading and unloading kilns, keeping things clean, that kind of thing. So a lot of my time is split between being a studio manager, um, doing tech work, teaching, and then my own practice. I had a similar experience where I, I got in at the ground level of a studio when they were moving from one location to the other. And I learned a ton from that. Can you talk about being a part of a project in which you're learning a lot, but you're not necessarily making all the decisions. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm in a really unique position where I have gotten to be a part of opening a brand new studio and a brand new facility that teaches, that has classes running, um, which is also not on my coin, which is extremely special. And I mean, I feel really lucky to be a trusted person as a part of that. Um, I mean, everything I feel like that I know how to do in regards to making war. Well, I mean, I, I, I learned some things in school, but, um, you know, I learned a lot working for Deb and also just being an assistant to her and learning from her, you know, longtime expertise um, and her trial and error. Um, and her guidance was especially helpful, too, because, you know, as you come up with unique, you come into unique situations, you know having a mentor to talk to has been, you know, really invaluable. Um, but I mean, I learned everything on the job. I feel like, you know, trial and error and um, like all the tech work that I know how to work on wheels and kilns was just through working for her and spending a lot of time on the phone with tech support. <laughs> <laughs> 
but you know, like learning the flow of a space, each one is a little bit different, I think, depending on the needs of students and how big the space is. And I think our biggest challenge at this new space is the reclaim um, and just like the flow of classes. Yeah, you know, the very beginning is especially tough because you don't have anything to to go by. Um, so you're basically just building structures from the ground up. Yeah, I've been really impressed with Deb as a whole. I mean, I first knew her as an artist and I love her work. Like her pots are amazing. But then as I got to know her sort of outside of her making life, her ability to make a plan, stick to a plan, but also be flexible is now yielded two pretty large centers. So it's been really amazing to watch her sort of path. I don't know if I would have guessed like, yeah, she's going to end up having two art centers in the same city. <laughs> yeah. I think that that was probably not on her radar also. But I mean, having a second space, we just celebrated 10 years of Rat City Studios last year as well with the one year um, or recently with the one year anniversary anniversary of Rain City um, about the same time. So I think a lot of it is that um, all of the wonderful people that um we work with and the team that we have right now definitely makes it happen. I mean, she is brilliant. So I think that, you know, you got to have a good leader for sure. Um, but I would say our crew also definitely makes it happen. I feel like she should be teaching like courses on entrepreneurship because <laughs> she, she's she is actually, is she? <laughs> yeah. She, I mean, she's teaching a business of art class right now. Um, just through our studio. But it's an, you know, like it's an in-person thing. Um, but it's, yeah, she's very good at that. That was a lot of what I got through our assistantship also was um, business and like small business as an artist advice. Um, how to, you know, get your website started, like good things to keep in mind when you're selling work and, you know, things like that. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Can you plug your social media and website so people could get in touch if they want? My Instagram and my website are both my name, which is Anika Major, A-N-I-K-A-M-A-J-O-R, um, at Instagram or .com. Yeah, and then also Rain City, the the studio that you work at. What's How can people find out more about that? Yeah, so we have um, raincityclay.com, um, which has our, you know, classes coming up. And then, you know, I'm always there all the time, pretty much. My studio is there currently. Um, I work out of a space in the basement. So if I'm not there working, I'm there working on pots, which is there all the time. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate this. Thanks so much, Ben. It's great, been, been really great talking to you. I'm really excited to do it. I'd like to thank Annika for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with her. I've been a big fan of her drawing style and enjoyed hearing more about the ideas and process that makes that happen. Before we go, I'd like to give a plug for our second birthday of the Brickyard Network. That's coming up August the 16th is our official birthday, and that's also the day that we are launching an online auction and fundraiser. 16 artists have donated work to help us raise money to support this network. So if you're a fan of this podcast or any of the other ones on the network, don't miss this chance to buy work from folks like Sarah Pike, Roberta Lugo, Michael Klein, and many others. The auction is going to be happening August the 16th through the 19th. So if you'd like to find out more, visit giverg.us slash the Bray Brick by Brick. And on that note, I'd like to thank the Archie Bray. They are our main sponsor for the network as well as Amico Brent and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch at brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support.
This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.